The Holy Gospel according to John, the 8th chapter. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. It's possessive, my word. See, the word belongs to Jesus. It's not mine or yours or Martin Luther's. It doesn't belong to evangelicals, mainline churches, even Lutheran churches. It belongs to, and according to the first chapter of the Gospel of John, is Jesus In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Jesus is speaking in our Gospel text to believers, to those who are already following Him around the countryside. And His words promise that if they abide, dwell, hang out in the vicinity of His Word, then they will be genuinely and verifiably disciples of Jesus. Dwell. Hang out near the Word. This is, I think, what is at the core of Martin Luther's 500-year-old Reformation movement. A recalling of the church to God's word. Now, Martin Luther understood word as three things. First and foremost, as the Gospel of John states, the word is Jesus Christ, God's son, made flesh, full of grace and truth. Secondly, that word is scripture. The inspired written account of God's loving pursuit of humanity. Those created in God's very image. And finally, the word is the gospel proclaimed. The mutual conversation and consolation of the saints. The words that those who follow Jesus share in one another about the good news. So we are called and encouraged by Jesus to put ourselves close to the Word in all those definitions, to live near it. Doing so will genuinely make us disciples. Now an interesting thing to note is that we aren't making ourselves genuinely disciples of Jesus. Even by dwelling close to the Word, it is rather a natural consequence of hanging out in the vicinity of the Word. Just like smelling smoky if you sit near the fire or getting your mother's perfume on you when she hugs you close. If you think about it, it makes sense, doesn't it? If you have Harry Potter going on in the background every time that you're in your room, like my stepdaughter used to do, as a consequence, you'll know that series backwards and forwards, as she does. These Things that you hang in the vicinity of, dwell with, are near, change you. So how does this happen with God's Word? Well, Martin Luther expressed a belief grounded in Scripture that it is the Holy Spirit that acts in and through the Word to transform our lives. It's not something we do, but something done to us. All because we continue to dwell in the Word. Now this is one of those promises that many of us made, lo, these many years ago, when we affirmed our baptism. It is one of the promises that these six young adults will make today. I wonder if we truly understand how dangerous those promises are. Dangerous. Because to fulfill that promise means that we will be changed. 
and we will be freed. Now I've had conversation with confirmands for over 20 years as they are getting ready to affirm their baptism. And one of the things that we do is we go over the promises that they will make to live among God's faithful people. Which of course translates into hanging out with a particular gathering of the body of Christ, an assembly of disciples. And it's not just visiting them every couple of months, but it's living among them, surrounded by them, getting to know them, warts and all, letting them know us, warts and all. And this gathering, this assembly of the faithful, is the very definition of what it means to be church. It is an assembly of the faithful. And what do we gather around? Well, that's promise number two. To hear God's word and share in the Lord's Supper. Yeah, we promise at confirmation to do the very thing Jesus encourages us to do in this text. To dwell in the word, which is read here in this assembly every week. It's sung in our songs. It's taught in our Sunday school. Hopefully it is proclaimed from this pulpit. But also we hear God's word in our daily devotions, in our time individually in small groups away from here in Scripture. And we share when we gather, we share in the meal. The body and blood of Jesus Christ given and shed for us to regularly come to this table with brothers and sisters in Christ. We promise to proclaim the good news of God and Jesus Christ through word and deed. To speak not only with our words, but with our very lives about what the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus means to us. To be in truth and action what we say we are in words. To serve all people following the example of Jesus is another promise. It means to serve with a self-sacrificial love, one that's willing to die for the other, to touch the leper, to eat with the outcast, the homeless, the addicted, to heal, to feed. And to not just do that for those whom we like or think deserve it, but for all who are in need. And finally, to strive for justice and peace in all the earth, to speak and work for justice, whether it's in your school or in Syria, to strive for peace, whether it's in your home or in Iraq, and to do these things, whether it's popular or not, whether it's easy or not. Now, at the end of this time, I always ask the same question. I asked it of these six here. Are you ready to stand in the eyes of God and before your brothers and sisters in Christ and make these promises? Now most will say yes fairly quickly, but every now and again, every now and again, someone will hesitate. And you can see it in their eyes. They understand. They feel the weight of these promises. Suddenly, these aren't words to be affirmed so that mom or grandma and grandpa will feel happy, but they're promises made to the creator of the universe about how that they will strive to live their lives these next 80 plus years, God willing. And I've had more than one conversation with someone who hesitates. I'll ask, what's the concern? And invariably, the response is that I'm going to fail. That I won't be able to live up to these things. And in that moment, they experience the truth. And Jesus sets them free. See, the truth is that what the world tells us is an illusion. It gets stripped away. And all the gadgets and brands and tech savviness of the world will not help them here because it's on them, their lives, their promise, their sacrifice. And they know if that's the case, they'll come up short. And so I speak the truth. Oh, don't worry. You'll fall short. You will fail. 
That's the reality of things. The reality, Paul articulates, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That Luther echoes in his explanation of the third article of the creed, I cannot by my own understanding or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. This is the truth. That you are a sinner. Falling short of God's expectations on a daily basis. And there's nothing you can do about it except. Trust in Jesus Christ, who through pure grace loved you enough to die so that you might receive God's forgiveness in those areas where you fall short. And we do, don't we? We ignore our fellow believers and pitch our tent elsewhere. We ignore God's words, spurn the meal. We proclaim other gods in our lives and in our speech. We serve others just to meet our own needs And we get to the end of the day, and we know we have failed once again. But God does not leave us there. For God has claimed you in the waters of baptism. Washed us clean of our sin. And in these waters, forgiveness is available to us all the time. And we wash in those waters again and again to be renewed by God's promise. And we come... To be fed by God's word and meal so that we might go forth and strive. Try with the help of the Holy Spirit to be what God has called and created us to be. Disciples. Children of God. Saints. And this is the truth that frees us. That we are not perfect far from it. And that in that imperfection, that sinfulness, we have only this one option to place our hand, selves in the hands of a merciful God who because of His Son looks beyond these imperfections and in fact from these imperfect people builds a church, the body of Christ, God's means of acting in the world. You see... Martin Luther's Reformation 500 years ago is not just about reforming the church, refocusing us on God's Word, but it's also about reforming ourselves. Because as Jesus promises, the encounter with the Word will change us. And each of these reformations is an ongoing project. It's never-ending, kind of like road construction. There are things that need to be done continually, And the word that we bring, the word that reforms us, is needed in this world. Because how many of our friends and neighbors are right there with Jesus up until the moment that he talks about being made free? And their response is something along the lines of, whoa, 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 whoa. wait a minute, what do you mean free? Nobody's enslaved me. Nobody buys or sells me. I go where I want, do what I want, when I want. I make my own decisions. I'm doing pretty well, thank you. Really? You're free? Drug overdose is the leading cause of accidental death in the United States. Just over 52,000 lethal drug overdoses in 2015. The opioid addiction is driving this epidemic. 20,000 overdose deaths related to prescription pain relievers. 13,000 related to heroin in 2015. In 2014, 1.3 million teens battled drug addiction. 14.5 million adults, 26 and older. You're free? The average cell phone user checks their cell phone 110 times a day. Now in a 17-hour day, that averages out to about once every 10 minutes. Half of all cell phone users feel uneasy when they leave their phones at home. Half of all teens admit that they are addicted to their phones. You're free? There's $190 billion spent on advertising in the United States in 2016. That's double that in China, which is the next largest market. You're free? Really? We live in a world that seems to be increasingly tribal, turned in on ourselves, one that does not see the shared image of God in others, except those who look and talk and act like us. 
A world that walks with a jaunty self-confidence that we know the truth of things, everybody else is wrong, and it is into this world that we bring the word, having first dwelt with it ourselves. And it is into this world that we speak the truth that set us free. That we are all sinners, but that we serve a God who loves us even when we were dead in sin. Who made us alive together with Christ. And it is into this world that we go. Imperfect instruments to be sure of God's grace. But we go. So that it might be changed and reformed into the image of God. These six will be affirming their baptism today, but I would invite all of you to affirm your baptism again as well. To see the truth of where you have fallen short in these promises. To come forward, dip your fingers into the font, trace that reminder of who you are upon your forehead. Remember your own washing of forgiveness at baptism and then come and be fed at the meal body and blood, means of forgiveness of sin, strengthening in faith. Why? So that together we may go out and bear God's creative and redeeming word to a world that needs it. Amen.